appreciating that and our challenge a little bit with listening. So there we go. Okay. So today I want to talk a little bit about our country again and what we're going through and the things that we're seeing on a daily basis and the things that we can do about it. So let's start with uh, just looking at, at how maybe we should be, instead of saying, make America great again, which is a wonderful thing, we should be saying, let's put Jesus first again. Amen. So if we look at the headlines right now, we'll see, we see the condition our country's in. I just wrote down a few that I saw this morning. Um, as one says, Trump's devious coronavirus election strategy. Michigan's protest bellwether of dangerous partisan divide. COVID anger splits the U.S. Texas police officer killed, two injured in an ambush. And federal judges side with Planned Parenthood and deem elective abortions essential. Looking at all these things, we, there's a lot of bias we see in the media. We see all that kind of stuff on a regular basis. But one of the things that we need to remember is that's all just white noise. That's all someone's opinion. Now, I'm aging myself here a little bit. Um, I remember as a kid, the opinion pages in the newspaper was usually Dear Abby. I think that was all that was in there. Maybe one letter to the editor. Now that seems like all we hear is constantly people's opinion, and they don't have any factual basis behind it or not enough factual basis behind it to really mean anything to us. Our country right now is in a situation where we are divided. We're broken, we're fearful, and it's lost. And what the world needs most is Jesus. Jesus is coming soon, and we have a stewardship responsibility for what we have been given on this earth. You're shaking the whole thing. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jane, Jane was shaking the camera. That's, I was writing notes. It's now fixed. She's, she takes a lot of notes. All right, Romans 14, 11 through 12 says, For we all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. See, now that, that changes the world perspective a little bit, doesn't it? We're not holding a politician or a party or one side of an argument accountable. God holds us each accountable. Each and every one of us is accountable for ourselves and not for anyone else. I'm not accountable for my children. My children are not accountable for me. They're accountable for themselves. They can't go off of my faith and consider that to be a saving grace. Now, we've been called to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Luke 14, 25 through 27 says, Large, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to him, to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. What Jesus is saying there is if we really want to be disciples of Christ, if we really want to be the followers of Christ, our goal should be to take up our cross and follow him and to do what he did. One of the things I think that the world needs now more than anything else is a revival of faith. Right now the world needs revival, not just survival. Now I'm going to give you two biblical accounts of revival. And there are two slightly different ones, but they both have uh, a meaning for us today and, and kind of an idea of what, where we should be. The first one is Nehemiah. And we know in the book of Nehemiah, it talks about how he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. <clears throat> in Nehemiah 7, 4 through 5, Now the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not, been, not yet been rebuilt. So my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. At this point in time, Nehemiah is realizing God's putting it on his heart to bring the people out. He didn't want stones as much as he wanted living stones. He wanted his people back. It wasn't about the building. It was about the people. Going on again, this is what happens when a, when a true revival happens. Nehemiah 8 Verses 1 through 3, is three. it says, All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate 
in the presence of the men, women, and the others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. That, I, found, I find that amazing. They build up the walls first, and when they call the people together, it says they came and asked the teacher of the law to come out, and he read for six hours. For six hours he read. Now, continuing on in, in Nehemiah 8, verse 6, it says, Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. That was an incredible revival taken from a place where they had lost all sense of being and sense of self. They lost themselves as followers of God, and now the revival here brought them back. Now the second example I'm going to take, again from the Old Testament, is not a revival of people who came back to God, but a revival of people who came to God. There's the two differences. The first one is a revival of people who were with God, walked away, and came back. The second one, here in Nineveh, are people that are lost, that are redeemed by God. And we know the story of Jonah, and Jonah was kind of a reluctant prophet. He didn't volunteer to do much. God had to send him. And this is, I'm going to pick up here in Jonah 3, verses uh, 1 through 5, where Jonah is sent a second time. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a, a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. The fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Those weren't... Uh, very persuasive words. There wasn't anything very special about those words. He simply said, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. But that was enough. That was enough to change the hearts of the Ninevites. And they, they came to God. Now we look at our world right now and you might say to yourself, I'm not a very eloquent speaker. I'm not a theologian. I don't know a whole lot of things. You don't have to. If you let God, God will take care of it for you. God will speak through you, and God will, will do what needs to be done through you. So, what do we need to do to bring a revival in our country? Revival means second chance. That's why CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, that, that is a revival. And it means we need it gets a second chance. And our country right now is in desperate need of a second chance. We need another run at this because we did something. We, we messed it up. So, what's the first thing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some steps here. One of the things we need to do right off the beginning is we need to repent. We need to think about how did we get to this point in our country? How did we get where we are? Where did we go wrong along the line? There have been a lot of revivals in this country, and all of those revivals took off with, with uh, well-intentioned people thinking that the world would be that way forever, that our country would never change. But somewhere along the line it did. And I think each and every one of us has to take partial responsibility for that because we allowed it to go that way. So there's where some of our repentance comes. Isaiah 30, 15 says, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, the Holy One of Israel. In repentance and rest in your, in your salvation, in quietness and trust in your strength, but you would have nothing. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. God is waiting for us to come back to him. He's waiting for that repentance. He's waiting for that time where we come back and come to him and say, Hey, we know we're in trouble. We acknowledge our sin. We acknowledge the issues that are going on. And we want to come back to you. We want to bring you back into our equation. God's waiting for that. And I think anything else we do, if we don't start with that perspective, if we start with the perspective that we do have done nothing wrong and it's not our responsibility, then why are we even bothering? We need to look at this from the perspective of, yes, this is mine. This is my, this is my sin. This is my problem. I have been complacent. And because of our complacency, we need to repent to God and go back to him. Now, the second point I'm going to bring up is that we need to pray. And we need to pray with confidence. Praying is, is, obviously, it's speaking with God, it's talking to God, it's getting a hold of God's ears and saying, here I am, Lord, 
here's my suffering, here's my problems, what can I do about them? And God will speak back to you. God will talk to you. But when we pray, we should pray with confidence, understanding that God is a creator of the universe. He is all-powerful, and he is capable of anything. If we don't pray with confidence, why are we bothering to pray? Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I don't think anything, anything any closer, anything like, anything that we could do, that verse fits us so well right now. Help us in our time of need. Psalm 138.3 says, When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. That's what our prayer is meant to do. We're meant to call God and listen for his answer because that answer will embolden us. That's our strength. That's our, our roles. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Pretty black and white. If we go to him and we ask, and we ask in the right way, we ask with the right heart, we ask from the core of our being with repentance and prayer, we ask, it will be given to us. I just want, I, I saw this little meme on Facebook. I want to bring this in here. If a microscopic virus can do this to the whole world, Imagine what the faith of a mustard seed could do. Amen. That's what an amazing thing that is. So, I have a quote here from Spurgeon, uh, another man who led a great revival. This is what he says about prayer. Prayer pulls on the rope below and the great bell rings in the ears of God. Some scarcely stir the bell, for they pray languidly. Others give an occasional pluck at the rope. But he who wins heaven is the man who grasps the rope boldly and pulls continually with all his might. Our prayer needs to be continual and it needs to be bold and we have to do it with confidence. We have to constantly be in, a, in our mindset of prayer so that we can get closer and closer to God. As we ask him for things and we listen to him, as we sit back and just be still and know that he is God, we need to do those things confidently knowing that there are <laughs> answers. That God has answers for us. Now, the third point I want to bring up is if we want to have a revival, we have to have a passion for the glory of God. Our goal should be the glory of God, not the glory of man, not the glory of our country, not the glory of, of our church even. It is the glory of God that we are seeking in this. Our revival should be based upon the glory of God. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are a chosen people. We are chosen for a purpose. Our purpose in life here, our purpose is the glory of God. Our purpose is simply to glorify God on this earth. And in doing so, we should be praying for that revival. We should be trying to bring that in. Knowing that we have been given these things. That's that stewardship concept again. We have received so much. that we, we owe a great debt for that. And the best that we can do is continue the glory of God right now. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Everything we should be doing should be for the glory of God. That is our goal on earth, that is what we were meant to be doing, and that's how we should approach everything we do. So when we go and speak to someone, and we speak in love, and we speak in peace, when we go go forth and, and try and do these things for revival, we need to understand we're doing this for the glory of God. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not human masters. What we are doing, we are doing for God. There's another quote here. This is from Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, who was a uh, Roman emperor. He said, the true worth of a man is measured in the objects he pursues. So when we're standing there before God and we have to identify who we are and what we are, what's God going to see? What do we pursue? What's the most important thing for us? Matthew 6, 21 says, for wherever your treasure is, there your heart is also. Jesus says your treasure is, is where your heart is. And our heart should be on the glory of God. There's hawking in the background. 
Uh, point number four is we should have a burden for the lost and for revival. We should have a burden for that. It should be heavy on our hearts right now when we see the world in the way it is. We should have a burden for that. That's something that we should learn from Jesus himself. When we're picking up our cross and carrying our cross and following Jesus, Jesus was compassionate. He had that burden for, for the lost world. He came to seek the lost. <coughs> John 13, 34 through 35 says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. <laughs> that burden of love that we feel for other people, compassion that we feel for other people, comes directly from Jesus. Without him, we wouldn't have it. That's not a natural human condition. <laughs> Excuse me. Philippians 2, 3-4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul's simply saying there is what we should be doing, we should be doing for the gain of other people, not for ourselves. No matter what you do, do it for someone else. No matter what you do, do it with the intention of bettering the world around you. If someone needs, you should fulfill that need. Not because they're going to bless you for it, but because you're blessing them by it. As we do these things, it shows our compassion. It shows our love. It shows what we are really about as Christians and as people of God. It shows who we are because of our compassion. John 4, 35, Jesus says, Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the field. They are ripe for harvest. And Jesus said this again similarly in Matthew. Matthew 9, 35 through 38 says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I don't know if there's a better description of our world right now than what Jesus saw. Harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Amen. Look at our country. Is that not what we see? Yeah. People are harassed. People are helpless. They're worried. They're in fear. They're lost. If you've ever been around sheep, you'll understand that concept. If sheep don't, don't have direction, they are a fearful creature. They'll hurt themselves trying to run away from things that they shouldn't even run away from. They're panicky, they're frightened, and they are a real pain to be around if you don't herd them correctly. And Jesus said, boy, they are sheep. They're sheep without a shepherd. They are lost. Won't they kill themselves? Philippians 2, 1 through 3 says, Therefore, if you, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion... Okay. That make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. That sums it up right there. That's what I'm talking about here. We have been given a great gift, and if we have any encouragement, if we have comfort, if we have any commonness and sharing in the Holy Spirit, we are called to give that to others. We should be able to look at someone and say, you don't have the compassion of God in your life, and I can share that with you. You don't have the understanding of what God, how much God loves you. I can share that with you because I have experienced it. I feel it. It's in my life, and I can share it with you. That comes from our compassion, and that, that should be a burden on us. That should be something our heart should ache when we see the lost. We should be seeking to find those people. To go out and find the ones that are hurting. And I will guarantee that it will not be a long hunt for you. If you're looking for someone who's lost, you probably don't have to go too much farther than looking out your own window. Every single day, even in this isolation, we find people that are lost. Every single day, even in this separation, we may not see each other face to face, but we're seeing each other in other ways, and we see the lost. We can see it through our national media. We can see it through Facebook posts. We can see it through emails. We hear it. We hear it in the agony of telephone calls that we get. 
All of these things are right in front of us. So if we are not having a burden for that, if we have no compassion for that, then as Jesus said, you can't be my followers. Because he had compassion. He said, take up your cross and follow me. If you don't, then you're not my follower. It's that simple. It's very clear. Jesus is very black and white and clear about these things. So, application time. So how do we apply this into our own lives? We've talked about the, the fact that we need to be praying. We need to have. We need to repent. We need to pray. We need to have passion for the glory of God. We need to have a burden for those that are lost. Okay, so now, great. What do we do about it? What we do about that is go forth. We boldly go forth. We step out in faith, in the confidence that we have. We step out and start this revival. You cannot start a fire without a spark. And each and every one of us can be that spark. I heard a, an analogy once that um, well, I'm trying to remember. It was a, a scientist came up with. And he was describing the, the Cold War at the time. He said there is, he, he was describing the Soviet Union and the United States on either side. And he said there's a room that's needy. In that room facing each other with millions and millions and millions of matches just waiting to start up that spark and, and blow up everything his little saying in the end was and then a cleaning lady walks in with a lighted cigar and sets it off anyway but the fire that starts a revival has to start with us it has to start with us because we know the truth we know the facts we have experienced the spirit we know what god has given us we know these things, so we need to go forth, and we need to do it boldly. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We know that when we labor for God, it's, it's, it's all beneficial. Everything we do is beneficial. If we're working, truly working for God, if we're truly living for God, if, if everything we do, as it said in these earlier passages, we do for the glory of God, that's going to be beneficial. That's going to be positive. Galatians 6, 9 through 10 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people especially to those who belong to the family of believers. We need to do good to all people and not get tired of it. It's easy in this world to get frustrated and quit. So many people are doing that. They get frustrated and they just stop. They decide that, you know, nothing's, nothing I do is going to matter anyway. God says, no, it does. It does. Don't get tired. Keep going. Keep, keep pushing. Go, go forth boldly in love and share the, share the gospel. Share the good news with other people. Now in 2 Chronicles 7.14 it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Would you love to be the spark that starts that? Wouldn't that glorify God if we could start that movement in our own country? Wouldn't it glorify God if our country turned to God and then that reflected and another country saw it and another country saw it? We could have a worldwide revival that comes out of a coronavirus pandemic simply because people right now are desperate and they are seeking more than it has been in the rest in my entire lifetime. More than ever before, people are seeking answers. Boy, we got the answers. We keep them to ourselves. Shame on us. Second Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just in fact, as you are doing. Paul talked to the Thessalonians, told them, you're doing it right. You're building each other up. You're encouraging each other. As you do those things, continue. Continue to do those things and move forward. 2 Timothy 1.7, I love this one. This is, this is about the Spirit of God and who we should be. And how we should not be afraid. 
2 Timothy 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Encourage, oh, excuse me. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For the Spirit of God gave, that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. The Spirit gives us power and love and self-discipline. We are not meant to be timid. We are not meant to be afraid. We are not meant to be fearful. We are meant to be bold and strong, to be courageous. We know the answers. We have the solution. If right now you had the formula that was the perfect vaccine for the coronavirus, would you keep it to yourself? Or would you ring every bell in the, in the world and say, here, here it is, I have it. And would you not give it freely to everyone and say, here it is, I got the solution. Well, we do. We have the solution. The ultimate solution is not a vaccine. The ultimate solution is Jesus Christ. Because God loved us so much that he sent his son. He sent his son to die for us. To suffer, to die, to bleed on the cross, to cover our sins. And he resurrected his son to give us eternal life. Though that is the good news. That is the ultimate solution that the world is looking for. And we have it. If you were hoarding the vaccine, would you not feel guilty about that? If someone else hoarded it and didn't share it with you and you died because of it or your family died because of it, would you not be upset about that? Think about that concept. This ultimate solution that I'm talking about right now, Jesus Christ, is, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Everlasting life is only available through Jesus Christ. Now, if you know this, and like me, you, you believe that wholeheartedly. It is in your heart and it is complete. And you're not sharing it. And someone goes to hell and says, wait a minute. I knew Shannon and he never told me about this. When they stand before God, as we know that everyone will someday, well, they say, well, wait a minute. I had people that knew this and didn't tell me. Would well, you want to be that person? We can be like Nehemiah. We can go forth boldly and build walls and, and build cities up and raise people back into revival. We can even go like Jonah and do it reluctantly because somebody in a blue plaid shirt is telling you you need to be doing it right now. I don't care. We just need to do it. We need to go forth and do these things to bring God back to the forefront. And the reason we really need to do these things is because we have been ordered to do so. <clears throat> Not a suggestion, not if you feel like it, not if you're trained for it, not if you are qualified, not if you are eloquent, not if you are gifted. All of us have been ordered to do these things. Matthew 28, 19 to 20, that is what's called, known as the Great Commission. And as the Great Commission, it is a command. God says, this is what you are supposed to do. Jesus said, therefore... Go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded them. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Jesus says, go forth. Go and make disciples. Go. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. And that day will come and we'll stand before God and he'll say, did you follow my rules? Did you do what I asked you to do? Simple as that. So if we spend our whole lives and we do not share the gospel, what was our life worth? But on the other hand, imagine the glory to God that would come from a revival in this nation. In your community. In your family. Imagine a revival that caught fire and people were on fire for God. Imagine the glory of God that would, would come from that. God's just waiting for us to do these things. He's waiting for us to get off the couch and get to work. That's another analogy that I was thinking of today. I hear people all the time talking about 
sitting at home during this pandemic and eating like a horse and, and sitting like a slug. People are not doing anything at all. They're just sitting around binge watching television, doing all these things. We have all this opportunity. We have free time and they don't know what to do with it. Boy, God says, use this, go forth. Everything else is gone. Good. You want to call your friend? I bet he's home. <laughs> I bet they're available right now. You, you got somebody you need to talk to? They're probably not overly busy right now. At least they can't give you the excuse. Give them a call. Talk to them. Share with them God's word. <coughs> In Isaiah 6, 8. Isaiah says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? God's saying that to us today. Who should I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah said, Here I am. Send me. Here I am. Send me. I think that's what all of us need to be doing today. And it may look different. Not, every, not each one of us is going to do it exactly the same. Not everybody's going to look the same or sound the same. But we have the same God. We have the same purpose. And we have the same drive if we're, if we're pushing for revival here. So we need to boldly step out. Again, I'm going to bring you back to Joshua 1.9. That, that verse is just pounded into me day after day after day. God told Joshua, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wherever we go, God is with us. So we need to take him out there and show him to the world. This is what God's calling us to do right now. We need to each of us stand up and say, here I am. Send me. Let's pray.